Welcome back into the Pick and Roll NBA podcast with Jet and Sap, presented by Full Press Coverage. Sap, we've been talking a lot about the Celtics uh, lately, so I figured let's turn our attention to the team you're rooting for because, you know, your guy LeBron James, uh, though he hasn't been playing all that much, he has rejoined the team recently, but the Lakers, after starting just horribly to the season, have seem to have found their footing a little bit. I don't want to get, you know, too overblown and go like what you were saying, where they'd be, you know, in the mix in the Western Conference Finals. I don't think they are. We can say that at all. But they've definitely been playing better. And that was highlighted by uh, what was their best win of the season in Milwaukee, beating Giannis and the Bucks 133 to 129 last week. Um, and they have won seven of their last 10 games, Sep. So a lot of the ship has been righted a little bit, and I think mostly the credit goes to Anthony Davis, who you predicted as an MVP um, at the before the season started, Sap, and he has been playing an MVP level over, I'd say, the past 12, 15 games um, of this season. He's been putting up phenomenal numbers and playing great defense. Yeah, they got off to a 2-10 and 10 start. It looked like the worst team in basketball. So what they've done is they've righted the ship. They're 10-13 and 13 right now. And over the last 10-11 games, Anthony Davis is playing like a top-five player, which talent-wise, he is. He's been averaging 35 points, 15 rebounds. He's had monstrous games against Giannis. He put up 55 against Washington a few games ago. Uh, had to leave the last game for the Lakers against the Cavaliers for flu-like symptoms. We'll see how that is how long he'll be out with that. But really, over the last, I'd say, three, three and a half weeks, he's been arguably as good as any player in the league because not only does he give you 35 and 15, he's an elite defender. I mean, I think he's more skilled than Giannis. I'm not saying he's a better player than Giannis, but he's more skilled. He can do pretty much everything Giannis can do except a bit more, and he's as equally good a defender as Giannis is. Uh, so I, I think, you know, with him playing at that level, LeBron kind of scaling it back a little bit on the three point field goal attempts and Russell Westbrook playing at a pretty good level coming off the bench, got 15 assists the other night. I think the Lakers at least can get into the play in and eventually maybe be a top six team in the Western conference and at least make this worthwhile watching them. Yeah. I mean, like you said, they looked, uh, I mean, we were, we were writing them completely off after the first 10 games of the season, they looked completely dead and lost and, and frankly disinterested, um, and now uh, they found their groove a little bit. Westbrook, you know, is playing is playing well for them. Uh, really, he is. Um, we, we mentioned that actually last week that he hasn't wasn't the problem and he's continued to play well for the for the Lakers. Um, and Anthony Davis is playing the best he's played since he was in the bubble, I'd say. Um, you know, and he seems other than the flu, relatively healthy in that 55 point game against the Wizards. Sap, he also shot nine of nine from the free throw line and had three blocks and 17 rebounds and was 22 of 30 from the floor. So it was an extremely efficient 55 points too. Um, and, and that's what he's been most of the season. His, his uh, field goal percentage has been throughout the season uh, almost 60% from the floor sap. So he's really uh, he's playing at the level that we saw him play when they were in the bubble. And when he was in uh, new Orleans, uh, which is, you know, the Anthony Davis that people that made the all time NBA 75th anniversary list. You know, a lot of people are questioning that the talents there. He hasn't been durable. Um, and so far this season, he has been and he's been playing, I, I would say, with something to prove a little bit, it seems like, Sap. For sure. You heard that I picked him to be the league MVP. So, yeah, he, that's you know, what he's proving. Won. Absolutely. And I was mocked and laughed at when I made that prediction and probably rightfully so it was a little bit from left field or from the bench, but he's that talented. There's no question about that. I mean, you look at all the big men in the league, whether it's Giannis, Anthony Davis, Embiid, Jokic, those are like the first four that come to mind. I mean, he's as skilled, if not more skilled than those guys. And he and Giannis are elite defenders where Embiid, I think is a good, not a great defender. Jokic is solid defensively, but not an elite defender. I mean, Giannis and Anthony Davis can beat you on both ends of the floor. His mid-range game is exquisite. He's great around the basket. He can score with his back to the basket. He can also face the basket from even 18, 19 feet out. Don't want him taking too many threes. He's not really good at that, but neither is Giannis. So when he's playing at this level, the Lakers can be a lot to deal with. And then Giannis, LeBron can fill in the gaps. 
And we know Westbrook, I have got to say, and we said this right from the get-go, Jet, he has not been the problem this year. Pretty much from the start, he accepted that move to being uh, a sixth man coming off the bench, gives them energy, can be a facilitator, um, and, and you know limit his shots. The problem with the Lakers is from four through ten, they may have the worst roster in the league. Like, who's their fourth, fifth, and sixth best players? Is it Lonnie Walker the fourth? Is it Dennis Schroeder? Is it Pat Beverly? I mean, that's really not a good roster after those big three players. And again, Westbrook being the third best player is problematic because he really can't shoot. Right. Uh, you know, that, that trade for Westbrook, we've you know, revisited time and time again. And, and, and despite Westbrook playing better this season, it was just a, a disaster. You see how well Kyle Kuzma is playing um, in Washington. He, you know, he's averaging 20 points a game. And they, I saw a report today that they've rejected trade offers for him and view him as a, as a pillar of the franchise. Um, and you know, there's other guys that the Lakers have lost and that their roster would be significantly better had they not made some of these, these questionable moves without a doubt. Um, but you know, over the past 10 games, they're making it work with what they have, which is, as you mentioned, Seth, not that much outside of the, the, the big three they have. It's really not that much outside of LeBron and Anthony Davis, you know, Westbrook now is he's playing well, but he's, you know, just a slightly above average player coming off the bench. It's not like, you know, he's an all-star, uh, at, you know, in contention for anything like that. So you know, the Lakers, if they want to be, you know, make a, a move to try to be m more in contention, they're obviously going to have to upgrade the roster. And that, you know, leads you to saying, well, they're going to have to trade Westbrook if a team will take him or trade some of those picks um, that they seem reluctant to do. And then who's the player that's coming in? We talked about Indiana before. It doesn't seem like the Pacers are going to be as motivated to make that Miles Turner and Buddy Heel trade because they're playing pretty well. Terry Rozier is a name that's been kicked around. Sap, do you think he's a good fit there? He could be, again, someone who can score, right? Because there are going to be nights where, let's say, LeBron's out and Davis is struggling, which hasn't been that often lately, but you're going to need some scoring and someone like that can certainly help their offense. I wouldn't trade Russell Westbrook at this point because to trade him, you're going to have to attach draft picks because he's going to be a free agent at the end of the year. So you, you're trying to trade that contract and we're already a third of the way in the season. So it's almost like why bother at this point, just ride it out, let him finish the season. He's playing well. Um, and then that contracts off the books at the end of the year. And then you can deal with maybe adding a free agent next season uh, they have the 2027 and 2029 first round picks that they might be able to move. Uh, again, the contracts have to work if if you get Miles Turner and Buddy Heald. But as you said, Indiana has been a surprise team in the Eastern Conference. They're they're in the top half of the playoff group right now. So why would they trade two of their better players uh, just to appease the Lakers? I mean, sometimes I think when people look at the marquee teams, whether it's the Celtics, the Lakers, Golden State, whoever. It seems like their fan bases think that like the other 25 teams in the league are there to just facilitate players to them, to make them contenders. Well, that's not how it works because these other teams are looking to try to build something as well. Like you said, Kuzma has been outstanding in Washington. Why would Washington want to trade someone who's averaging 20 points per game and is playing at a high, high level? They're trying to build something at some point. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point, Sap. I think it's something that you see a lot, especially on Twitter with NBA fans of, like you said, marquee franchises. They throw out these trades out there and you're like, well, well, yeah, that'd be great for the Celtics or the Lakers or, you know, but why on earth would another team do that? You know, it makes no sense. And so no one's going to just hand the Lakers good players for nothing because they're the Lakers. In fact, all 29 other teams hate the Lakers. The same with mm -hmm. the same with the Celtics and, and the Warriors, you know, teams aren't don't want to help them. Um, so, you know, that's that's definitely going to be a problem that that the, the Lakers have to have to face a, as well, Sap. But I, I think to to their benefit and I, I still don't view them as legitimate contenders or anything, even though they've been playing better. But to their benefit, water does seem to finding be finding its level a little bit in the Western Conference, Sap. Whereas a couple of weeks ago, we looked and the top of the Western Conference was the Utah Jazz and the Portland Trailblazers. They've fallen off uh, recently, and now they're the eight and the nine seed in the Western Conference. And, and the Lakers um, uh, sit about uh, three, uh, two and a half, three games behind those teams as they seem to be, you know, again, water finding its level, dropping to the competition. The, the one team that that hasn't started to surge yet, and I think people are still waiting for them are the Golden State Warriors haven't played really well. They're at 13 and 12. They're currently the 10 seed. Um, so the Lakers have the 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 uh, 
you know, the good fortune of Anthony Davis playing well, LeBron coming back, and a couple of teams that started the season off hot now dropping off a little bit. Yeah, and I think there's some issues in Golden State, and I think it has to do with Draymond Green. I think what happened in training camp, um, you know, is not a good thing for that team, and it maybe divides the locker room. And Jordan Poole, who signed a big contract, hasn't really played up the par. Um, some of the young guys haven't developed, you know, whether it be Wiseman or Kuminga, they were supposed to take that next step this year. Heck, Wiseman was in the G League for seven games before they called him up. So I think that there's some problems in Golden State. I think you look at the West, I still like Denver. I think that they have a chance to be the best team in the Western Conference, especially if they can go ahead and make a trade to add something. And again, we bandied about Kevin Durant, which would be a huge move for the Denver Nuggets. But I, I think that they have a chance to be the best team in the West. The West to me is just so wide open, whereas the East, I think we're in agreement that it's the Celtics, Milwaukee, and I still put Cleveland in there because Cleveland did beat the Celtics twice this year, both games in overtime. And they are really playing good basketball right now. And they're also a, a team that can add a piece, especially like a wing defender, uh, going into the second half of the season that might put them over the top. But the, the West is like, you know, there was a point last week where I think one through 10, there was a three and a half game difference from the top to the 10th team, which is pretty amazing because we are a third of the way in the season. Um, you know, you got a team like Dallas, which can start peeling off wins with Luka. Uh, the West is wide open without question. Yeah, Sap, it remains three and a half. You know, all one through 10 are, are all over right. 500. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's absolutely wide open. I mean, Listen, the bottom teams, the Houston Rockets and the San Antonio Spurs, you know that they, you, we knew they were going to be the bottom teams. They're going to remain at the bottom. Uh, but everything else, you know, everybody else is competing. Uh, I, I would imagine the Thunder will continue to slide, you know, back down towards the, the bottom. They're 11 and 13 right now. They should they should continue to be bad, but they play hard. Um, and, and in the East, uh, the bottom, Orlando, Detroit, um, Charlotte, I think we all thought they were going to be bad. I thought Detroit would actually give me a bit better, but they haven't had Kate Cunningham for most of the season. and He may not play mm -hmm. again this season. So I think that makes a lot of sense why they've not played very well. The most confusing team in the Eastern Conference staff is the Miami Heat. Uh, Jimmy Butler comes back. They beat the Celtics in Boston, which basically teams have been unbeatable at the Garden this year. Celtics and the Bruins. Butler was fantastic, hitting big shots down the stretch in an overtime. And then they lose to... Uh, they lose to a bad – I forget who they lost. They lost to the Pistons, and they also lost to uh, the Grizzlies without John ja Morant. So make heads or tails of the Miami Heat. Yeah, that was a weird scheduling thing with the Celtics in Miami, right? They played Wednesday at TD Garden, then they played Friday at TD Garden. The league's throwing some of these types of scheduling. I wouldn't call them a snap foo. I mean, it's, it's planned that way, but to save on travel – I'm sure, right. you know, guys from Miami would love to spend four days in late November, early December in Boston. I'm sure that's why like the best place they want to go. Yeah. Why <laughs> would you rather you know be in Miami than here for sure? But uh, that happens. So when you have that type of situation, the home court advantage isn't as big in that second game because the guys are comfortable. They're, you know, able to, to feel comfortable shooting in the arena in the same city for a few days. So they kind of button it up a little bit and play a little bit better. Look, Miami always gets up for the Celtics. It's a rivalry. So, yeah, that, that's a team that's been very, very strange. But, again, um, a lot of people feel that the season doesn't officially begin till Christmas Day. We're a few weeks away from that. and We'll get a better read on that. But, uh, I, you know, I think so far a third of the way in the season, we kind of see what these teams are all about. The Celtics, Milwaukee, they look like the two best teams in basketball. I throw Cleveland at number three, and then you jump over to the Western Conference, and it's like – from week to week, that could change. Yeah, absolutely. And Cleveland had a great win last night beating the Lakers. Sap, I know Anthony Davis left, but Donovan Mitchell was phenomenal in that game. <laughs> um, and he, he seems to be playing his best during these big games. He's been great against the Celtics when they've played. <laughs> the Celtics and Cavs have played. So seeing huge dividends for that that big move from the Cleveland Cavaliers. But uh, before we, we finish up, Sap, let's, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about uh, some end-of-the-season awards. We're not going to predict them. But the NBA has announced some new awards and redesigns to a lot of their trophies. We're obviously not going to be talking about how the redesigns look because this is a podcast and you, we <laughs> aren't showing what the redesigns are. You can go look at that at your leisure. We, we can tweet out that link if you'd like. Um, but uh, they, they, they've they redesigned a lot of these and they've renamed some of the trophies too and added some trophies that have never been uh, there before. Um, starting with the... 
Maurice Poldoff Trophy, um, which is going to be the uh, award given to the team that finishes the season with the best record. I believe it's called the President's Cup in the NHL SAP. Is that right? President's Trophy goes to the President's team with the most trophy. points. Yep. Sorry, it's not a cup. Stanley a Cup. Stanley Cup President's Trophy. Okay, President's Trophy, showing my hockey knowledge off, um, is is the equivalent in the NHL. And so now the NBA has added this too. Uh, Maurice Poldoff uh, was also, also the name of the MVP award, Sap. It was, yeah. Yeah, so they're going to change that. For that. Decades. And they still haven't announced what they're going to change it to. I mean, Maurice Podoloff was the original commissioner of the NBA. I mean, now we have the next um, name of the MVP trophy. Do we name it the – David Stern has nothing named after him. And, I, you know, I think he is arguably the – well, for 20 years, the best commissioner in the history of the league. And then for 10 years, I think the power went to his head. and It was a little bit yeah. too much. But I think he was a great commissioner. The, the sport grew under his leadership. Now, it also helped that Michael Jordan showed up in 1984 and – had a bigger role to do with that growth than anybody. But nonetheless, Stern was the commissioner, and I think he did a great job for the most part. So maybe they name an award after him. Like the MVP of the league is going to be – do you want to name the MVP of the league after a commissioner, though? Um, Kareem right. has an award named after him already. He's coming to a humanitarian award. He has the most MVPs, six of them. Um, you know, Bill Russell is the finals MVP award, is named after Bill Russell – so, yeah, I mean, it, it's a little bit too much at this point. Aren't they also giving out, like, trophies to division winners? Uh, I, like, I, they, they are. I, well, they, they give out a trophy to the yeah, – who you, when you win the – not the division, I think just the conference. Right, but it's just – it's a little too much. I'll be honest with you. I think it's, it's kind of, like, over overkill. To be honest with you, like, usually no, no you're one's... not the grumpy old man. You're you're like I all know, for I all today. the trophies. I now so. you're you're yeah. upset with all the awards. What well, is coming to this confusing. generation, Sap? Everybody I gets know. a trophy now. I know, I know. You get to end up with the best <laughs> record, and then you lose in the playoffs. And like, are the team's going to show that thing off? I mean, imagine. Okay, I'm not trying to curse the Celtics here. The Celtics with 17 championships. That's what they're measured by, right? Championships. Although the last half dozen years, we kept hearing that they, you know, made it to the Eastern Conference Finals and. You know, yes. the, other than not being able to beat LeBron, they would have won championships apparently. But that's a franchise. That and the Lakers, the Celtics and the Lakers are measured by championships. So all of a sudden, the, Lakers, the Celtics are right now the leading candidate to have the best record. So they're going to win the Maurice Podoloff trophy and then lose in the finals to whoever. And you think they're going to probably display that? You know, I, I don't, I hope not. Not when it's you're in go to the, 17 championships and championships. It goes, it goes to the same place where uh, Belichick sends the AFC championship trophies, which is, I don't know, some back room janitor's closet or something. Is that, like is that. that where they, is that where the videotapes were hidden? <laughs> Maybe. 2007. That's where, yeah. That's where, that's that where, that stuff be, is that's where the, Belichick puts those, but yeah, yeah I, the, I understand. The deflated footballs, all the deflated footballs, the tires, the pumps and okay. the pins and all that other stuff. Okay. Use. Sap. I see. You're just using it, using your, how is Bill, how is Bill Belichick without Tom Brady? How is uh, Bill Belichick without Tom Brady? 10 games under 500 in 10 years. Yeah, that's not, all I'm going to say. It's not not great. It's not great. But no, uh no. maybe he can get a college job if he's leaving here. Oh yeah, I'm sure I'm sure he could. Um yeah. so so Rutgers. we got that award. Right. <laughs> <laughs> he does love Rutgers. They we got that Rutgers. award, Sap. Um, and then they've renamed a couple of trophies. The uh the sportsmanship award is now gonna be called the Joe Dumars trophy. Yep. Um, you know, named for Hall of Famer Joe Dumars. Uh I I he I guess he was the inaugural winner of the award. So they figured, okay, we'll name it after Joe Dumars. He's been part of the NBA for a long time as an executive, as a player. Obviously, he's in the Hall of Fame. Any problems with that one, Sap? Well, it's just ironic that the guy that won the Sportsmanship Award, the first Sportsmanship Award, played for the bad boys. Because yeah, in comparison funny. to his teammates, he was a sweetheart, right? I mean, we don't even know. But he was a good guy, Joe Dumars. I mean, he was kind of like the outlier on that team. Isaiah was constantly battling with people. Isaiah is a great leader. And then you had obviously Mahorn and Lane Beer and Rodman, you know, it was kind of a motley crew, but no, I don't have a problem with that. I mean, they, the NHL, it seems like the NBA is trying to copy the NHL of all places, right? Very now much. you got this trophy, the Maurice Podoloff trophy, which goes to the team with the most, you know, with the best regular season record. Now the NHL has the lady Bing award, which, um, you know, goes to sportsmanship. Uh, are they going to now start saying the best defensive? Well, they have a defensive player of the year, which is, you know, the Selkie award in the NHL. So 
Yeah, I mean, they, just name everything. I mean, I don't know if they're going to bring in sponsorship dollars with all of this. If they do that, that's great because that helps the bottom line. The players will benefit from it. I have, I have no problem with that, like putting logos on uniforms and all of that stuff. I have no problem with that. That's that's the world we live in right now in 2022. I, I don't have a problem with that. But, yeah, I mean, sportsmanship award, sure. Joe Dumont, manager of a championship team in Detroit, and played on two championship teams and always always handled himself with incredible amount of class. Again, ironically, playing on the bad boys. He was, he was, the, uh, right. he was the outlier on that team for sure. Uh, the other trophy they get, Sap, uh, the Twyman Stokes Trophy, uh, offer, honors Twyman, who supported teammate Murray Stokes after he was injured in the game and later came mm-hmm. down with uh, a, a nectophalopy. I can't pronounce that word. It, but, uh, yeah, so we got a sports yeah, award and a teammate Yeah, he was a, he became a, a paraplegic. Award. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's good. I mean, you know, the right now Blake Griffin might win that. You know, he just sits on the bench and cheers the Celtics, and then when he plays, he – He's your 13 and eight the other night. Right. So maybe you give that to a veteran player who just kind of goes about his business and, and understands his role or whatever. But yeah, that, that's, these are all fine. It's just Russell Westbrook you know, sap maybe this year. Yes. Yeah. Who thought <laughs> Russell Westbrook would accept being, you know, coming off the bench and being a sixth man. He's been fantastic. That would be, that would be hilarious. Yeah. Cause I mean, Westbrook's <laughs> always been a guy who can't play well with others. Right. I mean, whether it was Durant or Harden or, Beal or whoever, and all of a sudden, in his twilight of his career, he all of a sudden wins, you know, the best teammate award. That, th- these could be funny, these selections, and I'm sure we'll give out our awards later in the season. We could have a lot of fun with this. Who would, if they had a worst teammate award, uh, besides it it going to the Nets every year, would it be named after Kyrie? Kyrie Irving, yeah, that, that would make the most sense. I guess he's getting booed the other night in Brooklyn. Right yes. by the fans on that in that Celtics game, got off to a really good start. Then he just disappeared. And again, you know, he's anti-Semitic, and uh, what better place to be an anti-Semitic person than Brooklyn, New York? Like I, is like maybe they should ship him to Utah, where you know maybe his thoughts would be welcomed, or not really um, protested. But yeah, Kyrie's probably right up there. I mean, because he's not available. That that's part of being a good teammate, right? Like being available. I mean, like last year, he, he played a third of the games because he wouldn't get vaccinated. He needed time off for all different issues. Uh, that that's a big part of being a, a good teammate is to to show up and play. Yeah, him and Ben Simmons are the two most unavailable players in the league, and they so they both could they're both uh, eligible for that uh, the anti uh, teammate of the year award. And uh, we already knew Sap that the uh, the Red Auerbach Trophy was for the coach of the year, but they redesigned it a little bit and they put in the statue of Red Auerbach as part of the the trophy. Now the statue that you can see at uh, at in Quincy Market in Boston is actually I thought that's cool that that's part of the trophy sure. now. Yep. Yeah. That's great. I mean, that he well deserved it. I mean, the guy was, you know, um, when you think of NBA coach in the history of the sport, he's like the first person that comes to mind. Obviously, Phil Jackson has more championships than Auerbach and, and Popovich. I think he's right there as a great coach. But yeah, Auerbach's the guy that was like almost like the first NBA coach, right? Like he just changed a lot of the dynamics of the sport. Also helped that he had Bill Russell playing for him. But, you know, um, that's well deserved for uh, the great Red Auerbach. Do you feel like, Sap, that trophies should be all named after a player or somebody that contributed to the NBA? Or are you okay with it just being the MVP award or, you know, defensive player? No, I think you could name it after someone. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the NHL the NHL and the NBA have a ton of trophies. It doesn't seem like like the, the NFL is the NFL MVP, the Associated Press NFL MVP, which my man has won four times. <clears throat> yes, Aaron Rodgers. Uh, not going to win it this year. But no. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think I think basketball and hockey just I, maybe because they need more attention than football, certainly, and to a lesser degree, baseball. That they decide to name these things, and and um, you know we'll have an award show where baseball does the stupid thing of giving out these awards after the World Series in oh, November. It's the worst. I don't think anybody's paying attention. Yeah, no one's paying attention to it. Like I really find it ironic that baseball's winter meetings actually take place in the fall. So you know they can't get that right. But, um, yeah, they, they kind of stretch it out. And by the time you give out the league MVPs, you're like, oh, really? The, the World Series was like a month ago. It's like, idiotic. Still I've, trying never, to do this? I've never understood it, why they do it. Right. That. Yeah. No, it makes no sense. So, no, I have no problem with them being named. I mean, if they want to even bring in corporate sponsorship, again, that's what we live in now. I have no problem with that. 
Right. Well, this is a recent trend. Like you said, Seth, they, they recently named it the, the Bill Russell Award for the uh, MVP of the of the finals. The Kobe Bryant Award is now the All-Star Game MVP. Um, you know, so those those are relatively recent additions uh, right now. So now we're just without the Defensive Player of the Year and the M- League MVP are now without names. So, I, I, like you said, Michael Jordan doesn't have anything named after him. Is it a conflict of interest at all because he's a current owner, do you think? Yeah. It could be. Yeah, it could be that, right? I mean, he won Defensive Player of the Year once, and he was a great defender, so I don't know if you could you, – I probably wouldn't name it. No, it would be for him. MVP. be for MVP, yeah. He won five of them, probably should have won eight. But, I mean, I always – I thought the, during a stretch that he should have been the MVP every year. Like, I kind of thought that LeBron should have been the MVP every year. Yeah, you can make certainly a very strong case for both of those yeah. guys. There's MB, MVP gets voters fatigue more than any other award. It gets voters fatigue. Oh, absolutely. I mean, Giannis could have won four in a row. Uh, Jokic is playing at the same level he's played the last two years, but no one thinks he's going to win it this year because the better narrative is Tatum or Luka, right? The two young studs who are playing at an incredibly high level. Yeah, it's more of a narrative award than just facts. Uh, You see that in the NFL. I mean, I think they've already given the award to Patrick Mahomes. And I'm like, just hold on a second. Jalen Hurts and Joe Burrow are pretty darn good, too. I think it's a three-man race at this point. Like, Let's not just give it to Mahomes because, right. you know, everybody's in love with him. But, you know, sometimes the narrative carries more than the actual stats. Yeah, I, I agree with you there. I, so, Sap, if you were to – I think Jordan makes the most sense if you were to name the yeah. MVP after. But, again, he's an owner, so I don't know if, the, if Could be. you know they, they would feel comfortable with that. For Defensive Player of the Year – they could name it after Dikembe Mutombo. I know he's done a lot of outreach for the NBA and, you know, now he's struggling with a cancer diagnosis. And, uh, you know, I think that would be a nice tribute to him. And he's sort of a larger than life figure. I think that would be a a good choice. Yeah. Without question. I think that that would be good. Um, You know, he's a a character. He's, you know, a guy that people that follow the sport late eighties into the nineties, you know, he was, he was someone that people really loved because he, he did, he had an outside personality for a guy that size. Normally you see those guys are recluses. He was kind of like Joel Embiid back then, not as skilled as Joel Embiid, but you know, kind of a, uh, a character at, at seven foot two. So I, I'd have no problem with the Kembe Mutombo um, getting the honor of being the defensive, the award being named after the Kembe Mutombo. No, no issue at all. I would like to see it be named actually after Dennis Rodman, but that would be uh, a dangerous proposition. Yeah, and they could, you know, maybe present the award in North Korea. Or, right. Know, or maybe Vladimir Putin could sponsor it because he's buddies with him too. You don't want to name an award after a loose cannon. I think that's uh, no. You know, <laughs> it's not great. No. Like it, yeah, the Academy Award isn't going to suddenly switch their, uh, you know, their oh, the Oscar to the, you know, Kevin Spacey Award or the John Voight Award or something like that. Yeah, no, 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 you don't want to have that, um, you know, or Will Smith either. I mean, you yeah, you want to make sure the person someone. is is a good person and you, you're you not yeah. going to have any problems with, because then like you're going to have to switch the name again. Tom right. Hanks would be a safe, a safe choice, right? Very like safe. He'd, he'd yeah. show up and handle it quite well. Tom Cruise, but Tom Cruise has never won an Oscar, but, you know, yeah, Tom Hanks would make more sense. Right. That's why they named, you know, the, uh, the Community Outreach Award after Kareem. Like, you know, he's not going to do anything crazy. Mm-hmm. Very safe choice. Bill Russell, you knew he was, and now he's passed away. Um, you, you knew you were, you were in, in, in clear skies there. Exactly. Exactly. Um, all right, Sap. Well, that's going to do it for us right now at the Pick and Roll NBA podcast with Jet and Sap. Thanks to Full Press Coverage. Sap, you got any columns coming out soon on Full Press Coverage? No, not really. Kind of giving it a little break probably till after the first year. Do you want to write about how uh, – for the first time, I think in LeBron's career, he's not leading a team in any statistical category. Not really. No, no. I thought that was interesting. I'm not interested. No, no, not a column. <laughs> no, not a column. I'd shoot that right. <laughs> but it is true, right? Yeah, because Davis is leading in points, rebounds, and uh, Westbrook in assists. But you know what? That that could bode well for the Lakers, right? So it doesn't all fall on him. And then he can be the guy who, if they get to the playoffs, he's great at filling in the gaps. Like that's where the comparison is with Magic Johnson. They were the two guys that were the Swiss Army knives. Like you just okay, LeBron, we need you to score tonight, so go get thirty six. We don't need you to facilitate because Westbrook can do that. And meanwhile, Anthony Davis is getting twenty two rebounds. So it may bode well for the Lakers that that's the case. There you go. So you've just created a column. Yeah, yeah. See, you, you tricked me. 
You I tricked did. me into it. So look for that on full press coverage coming out soon, <laughs> imminently. Um, yes. But yeah, check out Sap's uh, social media at John Sap twenty five. Check out mine at uh, Jet Stryer. Um, I think Sap and I should be doing more tweeting and complaining about the uh, the Veterans Committee oh. in baseball for yes. again passing up on your guy Barry Bonds. Not just passing him up, Sap, but like in an embarrassing fashion where just stiffs were getting more votes than Barry Bonds and Roger Clemens. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, maybe they can put some San Francisco Giants or Pittsburgh Pirates on the committee instead of loading it with Atlanta Braves and Toronto Blue Jays. Thus, you get Fred McGriff. It's all about favors. That happened when Harold Baines went in because there were, you know, members that had worked for the Orioles or the White Sox. So it's like, wink, wink, nod, nod, put my guy in. I'll take you, take care of you later down the road. So he's never going to get in. I mean, no, he's going to get in after he passes away. The same thing. Roger Clemens and Barry Bonds not being in the Hall of Fame is a joke. And and I'm at the point now where Pete Rose should be in. Although Pete Rose may be the one guy who benefits for not being in the Hall of Fame, he's turned it into a cottage industry. He's he's constantly in Cooperstown signing autographs. And, you know, he's kind of built a little bit of an empire and made money off of it. Clemens and Bonds made so much money as players, they don't really need to have it swing either way. But, yeah, it's a joke that, the, to me, the best player in the history of the sport and the best pitcher that I ever saw, and I've been watching baseball for pretty much 50 years, aren't in the Hall of Fame, and I don't think they're going to get in there until they no, I, pass away and they decide in 25 years to or 30 years to put them in. Yeah, which is gross. Uh, yep. I, I mean, I, I think the only Hall of Fame to me that I think has, you know, credibility right now is is the the football hall of fame. I think yeah. I've yeah. talked about, we've talked about this before. I think basketball lets too many people in. Baseball doesn't let the right people in. Right. So like football wins by default, I guess. And I don't know enough about hockey to talk about the hockey hall of fame. Maybe the wrestling hall of fame is the really the only great one. That's that's true. They, you know, they, <laughs> they, uh, Vince McMahon Trump's chooses in there. So yeah. Every Donald year, Trump's every year Vince the, McMahon decides who he wants. WWE. To put in that's how it works. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, Sap. Well, thanks. Those everybody. things work. One guy <laughs> runs it all. Yep. Thanks for everybody for listening, and we will talk to you later. Uh, and uh, yeah, oh, check out the podcast wherever podcasts are found. Pick and roll NBA podcast with Jet and Sap. See everybody.